I might just grab this. <coughs> Talking about the university discourse as uh, we were before. There we go. Uh, university of Ghent is one of the rare places in the world to have a department of psychoanalysis. <laughs> and the head of that department is sitting on my left. <laughs> It's a huge pleasure for me to uh, have Stan Van Hoyler here, uh, uh, an old friend and a man whose work I respect uh, profoundly. And uh, he will, I'm sure, give us a, this is really giving a build up, isn't it? A marvelous presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Professor of psychoanalysis at the university again, clinical psychologist, private practice, um, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum. Uh, to a member of the New Lacanian School and thereby the World Association of Psychoanalysis has written, uh, I know of two books, but I'm sure there are more. One is The Subject of Psychosis, which is a mentioned before, fantastic. Um, <clears throat> survey of Lacan's views on psychosis from uh, A to MA to uh, the end mm. and uh, a book on the DSM-5 I believe mm. which I must confess I haven't yet read mm. but it's a critique of, uh, of the DSM approach which I'm, sh which I'm sure is uh, withering. <laughs> Jonathan reviewed it so you can ask him. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you reviewed it, did you? For Frontiers in Psychology? Yeah. Okay. I must look. Okay. Good. And Stern's paper is The Father Function Revisited and Not Theoretical Reading. Without further ado, please uh, welcome uh, Stern. To, uh, Yeah, maybe, yeah. Well, let's say that I'm very happy to be here. Uh, it's a great honor that Russell in, in invited me for this conference um, on the late Lacan. Um, I decided to have a talk on the father function because I believe that this is one of the things that changes quite profoundly um, in Lacan's teaching. Um, okay, I have quite a long paper, very conceptual. Yesterday I gave a clinical talk with not many concepts, now it's many concepts. Starting with his structural approach in the 1950s and ending with his not theoretical move in the 1970s, Lacan elaborates different perspectives on the father function. His classic view originates in the 1950s, when he suggests that the father is a symbolic operator. Yet, by the 1970s, his ideas on what the father function entails have changed profoundly. And in this paper, I will explore these later changes and present, at the very end of my talk, a not theoretical interpretation of the father function, which implies next to the name of the father, also the concepts perversion and father of the name. I will discuss these concepts in detail and relate these to Lacan's ideas concerning la langue, that language written with two L's in, in English, which concerns la langue, which is a feminine strategy of dealing with the jouissance emanating from the sexual non rapport. Stated briefly, in the 1950s, Lacan suggests that the function proper to the maternal position is that of containing the child in a desiring love relationship, which at first is senseless and thus riddling in nature. In relation to the mother, the child is a so-called assujet, 
says Lacan, or a subjugated a subject. The function related to the paternal position consists of subjecting maternal desire to a lawful principle, thanks to which desire gets limited and at the same time gets attuned to the phallic logic. Indeed, if the paternal metaphor works, the jouissance of the mother is castrated by guiding principles. Rhyme and reason get attributed. And as, as an effect, the mother's actions are not random and capricious anymore. Obviously, the name of the father, this concept of the name of the father, echoes the Christian Lord's Prayer. And this points to the broader cultural context in which Lacan saw people functioning. With the name of the father, Lacan refers to a specific type of other, namely the one who acts in the name of a higher good or a higher truth, and who finally cannot but ground his actions on a dogmatically accepted universal principle or a divine instance. In the Judeo-Christian tradition, God is the ultimate father on whose shoulders the law is resting. Hence Lacan's expression, I quote Lacan, this place of God the Father, that's the one that I qualified as name of the Father, end quote. The biblical figure Lacan occasionally refers to as he discusses the name of the Father is Moses, who in the book Exodus takes the Ten Commandments down from Mount Sinai, thus literally bringing God's law to the world. As Lacan stresses in Seminar 10, in Exodus, God, on the one hand, manifests as a dazzling gaze and voice, which reflects the non-signified aspect of being. For example, Moses sees him as a fire that does not burn the bush. And people hear God's presence, presence via the overwhelming sound of the shofar. Moreover, God describes himself to Moses as the one who cannot but be defined in tautological terms. And then the famous expression, Eir Asher Eye, I am who I am. In relation to such enigmatic expressions, which Lacan qualifies as manifestations of an object A, an act of fate was needed to elevate the enigma to the status of a divine communication. On the other hand, Moses functions as a go-between for God and his people and communicates the do's and don'ts God formulated in his Ten Commandments. With the help of these commandments, moral judgments can be made that securely rest on the presumption of a higher truth. As in the 1970s, Lacan makes his not theoretical move, the paternal function is redefined quite radically. In the paternal metaphor, the father function entails prohibition of jouissance by abiding the laws of culture. The name of the father refers to the dead letter of the law, which only starts living by giving, by being imposed by someone who authorizes his actions on its basis. Hence Moses' role in the Exodus example. If Moses would not have been there to articulate the law, the Ten Commandments would probably still be resting on the flanks of Mount Sinai. From a not theoretical perspective, the initial relation between mother and child is situated on the intersection between the imaginary and the real. With the use of images, of which the model is to be found in the mirror stage, corporeality is addressed. Yet, the figure of the imaginary other 
is capricious and provokes all kinds of effective reactions. The name of the father disrupts this jouissance-laden relationship, makes a hole in it by situating it relative to a symbolic principle. The paternal metaphor implies that the cultural rules of interaction are imposed onto the relationship between parent and child. In the 1970s, two crucial aspects are added to the paternal function, which is made clear by those two new concepts he then uses, perversion and father of the name. Albeit in some different way, both concepts refer to modes of living and limiting jouissance that don't entail subjection to a symbolic law, but that are rather conveyed by the father figure qua generator. The name of the father points to the symbolic progenitor, who is always already death, since he is nothing but an operating element in a symbolic system. The terms perversion and father of the name, by contrast, point to the living generator who begets, causes, and produces things and events in life. With this new view on the paternal function, Lacan seems to be addressing broader societal changes, which implied that the roles attributed to the father and to the mother started to be more fluid. In the second half of the 20th century, established symbolic exchange relationships such as connected to the traditional roles of motherhood and fatherhood, lost much of their impact on individuals. And since then, capitalist consumption increasingly dominates human interactions. Henceforth, Lacan's attention turns to other modes via which the father function takes shape. Other modes of dealing with jouissance that get transmitted intergenerationally. The notion of perversion, and I will now elaborate this first construct, perversion, concerns the question as to how the father, quite generator, serves as a model in handling jouissance and transforming it in a yet to be attained surplus jouissance. What this time stands to the fore is not the prohibiting, prohib prohibiting act, but the active transfiguration of jouissance into an anticipated surplus jouissance through an example set by another. The perversion concept points to modes of dealing with jouissance that don't build on prohibition, but that still introduce a third element disrupting the position of being a mere subjugated a subject. Just like was the case in the paternal metaphor, the perversion builds on the model of a mediated social bond in which other elements add organization to the relation between subject and mother. Yet, this time, the father figure, figure qua third party, does not intervene by formulating restrictions all parties should adhere to. Rather, a way out of the binary deadlock is provided by obtaining an exemplar in dealing with the object A that differs from the model provided by the mother. In my reading, Lacan attributes two functions to the perversion. It provides a way out of the deadlock of the sexual non rapport and secondly, it creates a dimension beyond the desire of the mother. So first, it provides a way out of the deadlock of the sexual non rapport The perversion concept points to the diversity in how one can deal with jouissance and surplus jouissance, of which the version or the example provided by the father is one. Hence, perversion is the version 
of the pair, the version of the father. The underlying idea is that there is no correct or natural way of dealing with Jewish sons. We cannot but have a position of no rapport in relation to Jewish sons. One way out is that others might provide inspiration in the contingent search for a savoir faire that will also work for oneself. In discussing an example of such perversion, Lacan refers to the masked man from Frank Wiedekind's play Spring Awakening. Principally, this play, Spring Awakening, depicts three teenagers, Moritz, Wendler, and Melchior, who struggle to reconcile their awakening sexual activities with prevailing moral habits and opinions. Moritz and Wendla died during the peace, he from suicide and she due to a failed abortion. By the end of the play, the desperate Melchior visits his friend's grave and sees the ghost of Moritz, who tells him about the beauties of death. Melchior is tempted to join Moritz in death, but suddenly a mysterious masked man intervenes, preventing him from doing so. At first, Melchior, Melchior believes that the masked man is his father or the devil, which the masked man denies. Yet, his true identity is never revealed. The masked man promises Melchior that he will help him in developing a different perspective in life. And here's a quote from the play. I propose, says the masked man, to you that you fall, that you shall confide yourself to me. I will take care of your future success. I will take you out among men. I will give you the opportunity to enlarge your horizon fabulously. I will make you thoroughly acquainted with everything interesting that the world has to offer. That's literally from the play. Eventually, Melchior joins the masked man, leaving the regretful Moritz behind at the graveyard. In the preface that Lacan wrote to this play, which is published in the Autricri, Lacan suggests that the masked man, that the mask the mysterious man wears, covers a fundamental gap at the level of the other. The fundamental problem these youngsters are confronted with is sexuality, a factor that establishes a fundamental no rapport between people. Convention does not guide these protagonists in dealing with the sexual no rapport. And the role of Moritz illustrates this well. This young man finds no hold in convention or in identification with his peers. And as a result, he's massively invaded by Jouissance. Referring to the manifest appearance of Moritz's ghost, Lacan qualifies Moritz as a wanderer in the reign of the death, who is agitated forever since he couldn't find a place for himself by means of a guiding symbolic principle. Hence his suggestion in the introduction to the play that Moritz's position might be understood in terms of the expression le non dup air, the non duped er. Indeed, Moritz cannot cover the whole opened up by the sexual non rapport, and thus he ends up in endless desperation. The masked man in his turn provides Melchior a way out of this deadlock. Lacan indicates that this masked man is a pure semblance who literally gives shape to the possibility of living the problem of sexual non rapport. He suggests that young people like Melchior should not be ruined by the sexual non rapport, as there are ways of living life 
despite this major trouble, and hence his proposal to get acquainted with other men and to open up for new, interesting perspectives on life. Lacan qualifies the masked man's role as indicative of a perversion. On the one hand, he is some kind of a father figure who has confidence in the value of his own proposal. When qualifying him as a semblance, Lacan seems to suggest that the masked man occupies the role of an agent formulating a directive, like what happens in the master's discourse. Yet, on the other hand, the masked man is not the classic forbidding father who limits jouissance by formulating interdictions. Rather, the path he follows consists of proposing Melchior to actively learn a way of overcoming the deadlock of jouissance by relying on the know-how and the wisdom the masked man declares to possess. The masked man limits jouissance by convincing Mel Melchior of the possibility to find surplus jouissance elsewhere. He does not offer concrete solution, but installs a lack, a lack in the young man's lethal impasse. Disconsidered, the perversion generates perspectives that enable a further articulation of the subject and opens up the dimension of the phallus at the zenith of desire. Characteristically, he does so by selling hope and dreams. In this way, acting along the lines of a perversion has some similarities with how the customer is treated in our times of market economy. In both cases, one approaches the deadlock of the social bond by taking in mind promising satisfactions that are yet to be obtained. However, this does not mean that a perversion can simply be framed in terms of Lacan's capitalist discourse. What is typical of the capitalist discourse is that it cultivates the illusory ability of overcoming subjective discomfort by selling merchandise that would solve the problem of jouissance. And this installs, as Lacan says, a precarious social bond. Once the customer has bought and consumed, the entrepreneur retreats and goes looking for new clients. A perversion, like articulated by the masked man, is not literally selling a product, but promising an invaluable perspective on how life might be lived thus introducing the dimension of hope. Capitalist discourse promises timely satisfaction here and now. A perversion implies anticipation for a future. With a father figure acting as a guide or a compass for finding out, for finding out, for finding a way out of the deadlock of the sexual non -rapport. As I said, in my reading, Lacan attributes two functions to the perversion. On the one hand, it provides a way out of the deadlock of the sexual no rapport, which is what I just explained. On the other hand, it creates a dimension beyond the desire of the mother. Obviously, the perversion concept not only refers to the many versions that the father figure com that father figures communicate in dealing with Jewish songs. It is also not a coincidence that in French, perversion is phonologically akin to perversion, perversion, which makes clear that the concept has a sexual component too. From a Freudian point of view, we all enter life as polymorph perverse creatures. Subjection to the law, which makes us enter the world of desire, modulates our polymorph perverse nature in a phallic direction. But its impact is only partial. What remains 
is a particular relation to the surplus jouissance revolving around an object A, which is perverted by definition. Specifically, in seminar 22, Lacan says the following about the sexual aspect of the perversion. A father only deserves respect, if not love, unless this love or respect is, you won't believe what you hear, perversion-wise oriented, which means to say, takes a woman as the object A that causes his desire. Yet, how a woman welcomes this is not an issue. The thing she is occupied with is the children, which are other kinds of object A. End quote from seminar 22. This quote articulates how Lacan thinks of the maternal and the paternal function in his later work. The principal function attributed to the mother consists of taking the child as a, the pivotal factor around which desire is organized. If all goes well, the child is dressed up with object A-like qualities that stir the mother or the parent's desire. Such parental desire compensates for the fact that there is no natural bond between parent and child. The paternal function, in its turn, involves the necessity of a father figure being touched by a woman. Given the sexual non upper, a father has responsibilities in articulating a contingent desiring position in relation to a woman, which she might appreciate or not. Lacan does not say that his woman should be the mother. He is not promoting the classic nuclear family. Above all, the father's desiring position should make clear that a woman, which the mother always is, that a woman cannot be reduced to her maternal role. Therefore, his way of being touched by the semblance of femininity is crucial. For the child, it opens a dimension of desire beyond maternal desire. This considered, the father figure, the father is again not the thoughtful mouthpiece of cultural convention, but someone who bears witness to a choice, the choice of how he deals with the norapor. The father no longer merely transmits a knowledge concerning the law that guides desire, but just a version of how, irrespective of rhyme and reason, desire might be organized around the objective dimension in the other. A perversion demonstrates and conveys a feasible perspective on enjoyment. Obviously, such transmission only works if the father's version, no, obviously such transmission only works um, there is a wrong sentence in my text. <laughs> there is an error in my sentence. So, such transmission only works um, if the version communicated by the father speaks to people. It is just because the father figure is taken as a source of inspiration, that is, through identification with his perversion-wise traits, that he functions as a model. Therefore, in order to be operative, the functioning of a perversion requires what Lacan calls a turn towards the father, a version towards the father, version vers le père, eh? or an orientation towards the father. A father figure is not automatically an inspiring generator. He has to deserve the love of his offspring. In terms of the name of the father, the father is an authority who obtains respect because of his exceptional status. He has authority 
in relation to his offspring. In case of the pair you, this is not automatically the case. This time, respect needs to be gained. Therefore, Lacan says that the perversion points to the son's love and admiration of the father. If the son's love would not give the father his special status, he would simply be a sol solitary individual no one cares about. This is a component that also stood out in the role of the masked man in the play Spring Awakening. The masked man finally functions as a source of inspiration Melchior relies upon, but only because this mysterious figure first sold him the perspective of a bright future. Thus considered, a perversion only functions because of its seductive value. Only when holding the promise of a future drive gratifying bonus, it makes an appeal onto others. If psychoanalytic work is effective, an analysant will question such version vers le père or orientation towards the example provided by another and opt for own ways of handling jouissance, which is what the concept Santum makes clear. A Santum is a singular solution one finds in dealing with surplus jouissance. That me this means that it is a strictly private know-how that does not rest on the example of a father figure, <coughs> but that nevertheless constitutes a response, a response to the jouissance one is confronted with. By being oriented on a generator's perversion, one, so to speak, inherits the father's sins. That is, his choices and actions that cannot be framed by means of the law, but that nonetheless determine the subject. Psychoanalysis opens a space for reconsidering the docile position occupied in relation to the perversion wise paved path of the father and confronts the analysant with the possibility of framing a path for oneself, irrevocably making such choice implies cultivating the contingencies and particular stu stupidities oneself is made up by. This time, the sins that orient the subject are not the father's sins, but those of oneself. Hence the idea of the Santum. The sins make the man, l'homme. The perversion concerns only one aspect of the father qua vivid other who generates a mode of transforming jouissance. The other side can be characterized with Lacan's other later concept pertaining to the paternal function, that is, the father of the name. Actually, Lacan uses the father of the name concept only twice. Once during his seminar 23, and once during a related conference presentation concerning the symptom. Nonetheless, the concept adds an interesting supplementary viewpoint on the paternal function. The father of the name concerns the habit of developing conventional names. These, this constitutes shared reality where things and events have a common sense meaning. Yet, such naming bumps onto a limit, which it's what necessitates the symptom as an additional mode of naming. In the first session of seminar 23, Lacan introduces the idea of the father of the name by making a link to the Oedipal situation as well as to the symptom. What both 
has in common, he says, is that they name an element of jouissance. Concerning the Oedipus complex, this naming is pretty straightforward. The name of the father names maternal desire by articulating the intentions of the mother in terms of an organizing and guiding law. Yet, as in the symbolic register, paternity is marked by a fundamental lack, there is no other of the other, additional modes of naming are needed in dealing with jouissance. This is how Lacan gradually started thinking of the symptom. The symptom is not just an expression of repressed or foreclosed signifiers, it is above all a stopgap that names the jouissance the signifying chain fails to address, discovering the fundamental lack in the other. Hence, the following thought from seminar 23, and I quote, the Oedipus complex is as such a symptom, says Lacan. Everything is sustained in so far as the name of the father is also the father of the name, which doesn't make the symptom any less necessary. End of quote. Specifically, this quote articulates that to the extent that the name of the father isolates and packs jouissance, it is also a father of the name. Yet, naming jouissance is not a function that is exclusively destined for the name of the father. Given the limited impact of the father, other modes of naming jouissance are required. And at this level, the symptom plays an important role. And so to speak, also fathers a name supporting the subject. Hence Lacan's suggestion that the Oedipus complex, complex itself is nothing but some sort of symptom. Actually, Lacan first formulates the idea of the father of the name shortly before the start of his seminar 23, as he was lecturing in Switzerland and gave a talk on the symptom. During this lecture, which was translated by Russell Grigg, you remember? Yes. Yeah. So during this lecture, he introduces the father of the name concept by making a link to the biblical book Genesis, and more particularly to the elementary act of giving names to things in the world. In terms of the organization of the Bible, the act of giving a name to all creatures is more basic than the deed of imposing the law onto people's interactions. This is not only, this is not because the imposition of the law would only take place in the book Exodus, where Moses brings the Ten Commandments to the world. After all, already in Genesis, as God prohibits man to eat the forbidden fruit, human functioning is situated relative to a law But in the book Genesis, God doesn't claim the privilege of fathering names and gives man the mission of formulating names for all creatures in the world. Man obeys and indeed starts calling the creatures surrounding him by a name, just like God first did. And I quote from Genesis, 
Whatsoever Adam called to every living creature, that was the name thereof. End of quote. Within his logic, the fathering of names lies at the basis of shared reality. By calling things by a name, a joint communicative code takes shape. Thus considered, the language theory of the Saussure is very Genesis proof. The names given to objects are arbitrary, but once names have been formulated, convention reproduces the meanings attributed to a name. Specifically, during the discussion following his Geneva lecture on the symptom, the Swiss psychoanalyst Olivier Flournois asks Lacan a question concerning the link between foreclosure and jouissance, to which Lacan responds the following. And now I should... Uh, it's you. Melbourne, yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's 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 the quote. Yeah. For closure, Lacan says, of the name of the father, that leads us to another stage, the stage where it is not only the name of the father, but it's also the father of the name. I mean that the father is the one who names. It is very nicely evoked in Genesis, where there is all that mimicking of God who tells Adam to name the animals. Everything occurs as if there were two stages. God is supposed to know what names they are, since it's he who created them, supposedly. And then everything happens as if God wanted to put man to the test and see whether he knows how to mimic. Within this logic, the father of the name implies the mission of fathering common names for the objects and events composing the world. To have a good understanding of the novelty introduced with the father of the name concept, we need to turn to Lacan's later ideas concerning language, which is closely related to the question of femininity. In the 1970s, as Russell already mentioned this morning, especially from seminar 20 onwards, Lacan starts thinking about language based on different parameters compared to the 1950s. Henceforth, his point of reference is no longer the formal line of reasoning that he adopted from the structural linguistics, but the assumption that our living organism makes up a closely tied knot with language. Axiomatic concepts articulated during this later work include the idea of the speaking body, corps parlant, of the speaking being, par lettre, and of la langue, which express that corporeal jouissance is not so much neutralized by language, but carried along through speech. To situate la langue, one must assume that people speak because they are alive. Yet, what is life? For the self-reflective human being, corporal life is an enigma. And I quote Lacan from seminar 20. We don't know what it means to be alive, except for the following fact, that the body is something that enjoys itself. End of quote. The living body, he says, is an enjoying substance. It is an affected hunk of flesh. In his earlier teaching, Lacan suggests that language is a tool for mastering jouissance, which, for example, is expressed in a schema of double mirror. From seminar 20 onwards, this perspective changes. Language is no longer seen as a dimension that transcends the body, 
but as a fundamentally embodied process. And I quote again from Simon R. Twenty, the signifier, he says, is situated at the level of the enjoying substance. And also, the signifier is the cause of jouissance, end of quote. This might sound very abstract, but it's actually quite specific. Apart from the implicit structuring impact the symbolic order implies, the language the body first meets is the speech of parental figures. The body of the baby encounters affected babbling others who in somewhat melodious ways recite signifiers such that an impact on the body is created. Soothing speech, for example, might calm down. Articulating recurring sounds with a specific rhythm and intonation creates this effect. Though the parent might believe that semantically she is actually conveying a message. The rhythmicity and musicality of the swarm of nonsensical signifiers affects the flesh and has an influence on the corporeal jouissance, and this is how La Langue operates. Parental babbling might calm down the child, but alternatively might just as well remain powerless in relation to the child's jouissance or even aggravate her bodily distress. In any case, Lacan suggests that sets of signifiers that get articulated in relation to the child will obtain a special valence and be adopted in the child's own babbling, thus constituting the child's la langue. And I quote from the uh, Geneva lecture on the symptom, I quote Lacan, the water of language, he says, happens to leave something behind as it passes, some detritus which, which, he, will, which he will play with, indeed, which he will be forced to cope with, end of quote. Only if this process of grafting parental la langue onto the body is successful, the body will start babbling itself and turn into a speaking body called parlant. This frees the body from an initial state of autistic jouissance and adds speaking as an extra function to the body. Next to, for example, circulation or breathing. In terms of Lacan's later teaching, this is the crux of the maternal function. Grafting la langue onto the, body's, onto the child's body. This encounter will also create the speaking being or the parletre, which is nothing but the singular way in which a la langue functions relative to a babbling body. The parletre I am reflects the particular and peculiar way in which a la langue was grafted on my body. This working of primordial nonsensical, nonsensical la langue clearly needs to, be needs to be distinguished from common sense language. Lacan expresses this as follows in Seminar 20. And I quote, what I put forward by writing la langue as one word is that by which I distinguish myself from structuralism insofar as the latter would like to integrate language into semiology, end of quote. As long as the study of language concentrates on the complex relation between signifier, the signified, and the referent, it is nothing 
but a sophisticated semiotic theory. Yet, according to Lacan, the communicative function of language is only secondary. Above all, our speaking serves another goal, which is the modulation of corporeal jouissance. 